I have spent the last 30 years standing in front of audiences talking about drugs. <laughs> you got to admit, that's actually pretty cool. Often, I start my presentations with an apology. And I apologize for the lies of past drug educators, including myself. Specifically, we have told three lies. We've exaggerated the harms of drugs, we've never acknowledged the benefits of drugs, and we've never talked about the dominant model for controlling drugs in our society, which is drug prohibition that has failed us all so miserably. It does not protect our children. It does not protect our families. It does not protect our communities. In fact, this community is suffering an ongoing catastrophe. 914 people died of drug overdose deaths last year. If 914 teachers had died, the problem would have been solved tomorrow. If I had one slide to share with you, the most common slide I use in all of my presentations that really gives my framework, it's this one. It tracks on the vertical axis, health and social problems, including overdose deaths, against how drugs are controlled in our society. And on the left-hand side is prohibition. And if you just do prohibition, what you have is illegal market gangsterism that controls the process. And then you have illegal drugs, often strong, concentrated, and toxic illegal drugs, widely available, and a significant death toll from both drugs and, quite frankly, from bullets. Bullets are a public health problem. The other end of the spectrum, on the right-hand side of the U-curve, is legalization and promotion. So if we gave drugs to large multinational corporations and said, go for it, we would have all kinds of other problems as well. The answer lies in the middle. The middle of the U-curve is where my academic interest has lined for years, which is regulation of all currently illegal drugs based on public health principles. And that's what I tend to articulate. I tend to write stuff about that. My most recent interest is psychedelics. And my most recent paper looks at how we would regulate psychedelics in a post-prohibition world. And I think it's a significant crack in the drug prohibitionist's wall. Cannabis was first. Psychedelics are second. Psychedelics have been around since recorded human history. And there are alive and well traditions today that echo at, throughout human the drama for many centuries. Th four examples are the ayahuascaro use in the Amazon basin, the UVD, the Santo Daime church, and various shamanistic practices. The huicho use of peyote, the curanderos use of psilocybin mushrooms in Mexico, and the Siberian shamanic use of Amanita muscaria. Now, it's interesting, when I look at all of these traditions on a superficial analysis of, of them, is they all look kind of different. But they all share some things in common. They are all essentially pro-social. They are all communities that use psychedelic drugs to bond to community, to family, to tradition, to belief system, to neighbors. And they use them in the context of spirituality and healing and celebration of transitions, everything from seasonal changes to puberty. They are a cohesive force within the community. So it was historically unprecedented what happened in the 60s. Is Tim Leary, for the first time ever, gave an antisocial message. He said, tune in, turn on, and drop out. He said, disconnect from society, and psychedelics were linked with an antisocial message, and they've never been linked with that way before. It was historically unprecedented. Now, admittedly, just to be clear, there were other things going on at the time. There was the Vietnam War and the young folks who really didn't want to be plucked off their comfortable couches and given a gun and dropped into a jungle and asked to fight a battle they really knew nothing about. So there was a cultural background to that, but at the end of the day, the people who in power criminalized the drugs of the people who had less power. 
And there were lies associated with it. <laughs> LSD made me a prostitute. Girl give birth the frog. LSD fed ape rapes TV actress. So not only were psychedelics and other drugs banned, but the science was banned. It wasn't possible to do research on psychedelics for about 40 years. So looking throughout human history, how many other times has a science been banned? Well, there was one other occasion. It was illegal for 142 years to write anything about what you saw through the telescope. Because the status quo was that the Earth was the center of the universe. And the telescope was re revealing challenges to that belief system. LSD is to the study of the mind what the telescope is to astronomy and what the microscope is to biology. Well, psychedelics are back. Here is the Canadian Medical Association Journal, the conservative voice of mainstream medicine across Canada in October of last year, two years ago, they had psychedelics on their front cover. And there was two articles in there exploring the latest in terms of psychedelic research. So researchers tend to lump psychedelics into three categories. And I'd just like to look at psychedelics through the current research lens, because there is a psychedelic renaissance going on. We are now allowed again to do research with these rather remarkable medicines. So researchers tend to lump psychedelics into three categories. There's the classical psychedelics. For example, LSD, mescaline, dimethyltryptamine, and psilocybin. And what they offer is a sense of spirituality. There's a disorientation of the ego that happens that can be quite useful in some therapeutic contexts. They amplify unconscious material. They allow people to have access to stuff in their unconscious mind that normally we don't have access to. There's a portal effect. By that I mean it's a bit like climbing Mount Everest. When you finish climbing Mount Everest, the experience is, wow, I've done something significant. And that's exactly what psychedelics offer. The, wow, that was huge, is really useful in the treatment of many issues. Addictions treatment is also something the, psychedelic, the classicals offer. Psilocybin for tobacco dependency is something that's in the, in the literature today. Depression treatment, um, one of the big studies that's going on is looking at end-of-life anxiety and how psilocybin can be helpful for that. Another group of psychedelics are the empathogens. MDMA, MDA, and 3MMC are examples of empathogens. What they offer is connections with others, reflection on self, reduction of fear, and what I'm involved with is some research looking at PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And then there's all the other ones, the ones that don't really fit, ibogaine, ketamine, 2CB, salvia, et cetera. And they offer a variety of things, depending on what it is. Ibogaine, for example, seems to be remarkable in its ability to take away heroin withdrawals, for example. So I'd like to talk, this is about creativity, right? So I would like to offer some creativity. So as I said, my place of academic interest is to articulate post-prohibition models for the regulation and control of all currently illegal drugs based on public health principles. And this was the paper that I wrote most recently looking at psychedelics. When prohibition ends, how would I and my fellow authors recommend we as a society structure the experience of psychedelics is the question we asked. So I wrote this with two other authors. Brian Emerson is part of the voice of public health in the province of British Columbia. He works with Perry Kendall and the medical health officers of the province. Uh, Ken Tupper is a middle-level manager in the Ministry of Health. So interesting crowd. So we started by saying, what are the foundations? How do we think about this? Well, it should be based on public health. 
but it's not that simple because the Aboriginal communities that have been using these things for years should have a voice at the table. How should they be included? It's a question we asked. The most difficult part was how do we talk about youth access? How do we come up with something realistic for youth? And we rewrote that couple of paragraphs again and again and again, trying to figure out what to say. We also believe that we need to learn the lessons of cannabis legalization, which as it unfolds around the planet, sometimes it's being doing, done well and sometimes it's being done really badly. We should also have an evidence-based approach. We should be able to evolve and change what we do based on evidence. That is a shocking thing to say, but science should, facts should actually play a part in this decision. And we should also have an understanding of the potential benefits and risks of psychedelics. So let's look at that piece. Let's look at the risks. So psychedelics, ah, this, this graph is by probably England's most famous physician, David Nutt. And he ranks drugs on a scale of harm. And he does a huge amount of analysis. So it's not just harm to self, but it's harm to others. It's physical, it's psychological. It's a huge analysis he does. And his observation after tons of work is psychedelics on the right-hand side of this tend to be the least harmful drugs on the planet. The Interestingly enough, the most harmful drug in our society, generally speaking, is alcohol. Now, if you look at how to understand harms from drugs, there's really three different axes that we need to look at. One is toxicity, one is dependency, and one is behavior. So let's look at the toxicity piece. Albert Hoffman observed that LSD is probably the least toxic drug on the planet. Interesting observation. How did he come up with that? There is normally, for most prescription drugs, a one to six ratio between, t between effective dose and harm. By that I mean, if you took the last drug that you took that your doctor said you were supposed to take, and you take six times that dosage, you've probably done yourself harm. One to six is a common ratio. With the LSD, it's in the thousands. There's nothing else like it. So drugs tend to be, psychedelic drugs tend to be very non-toxic. How about dependency potential? I worked in the addiction services for 30 years. Nobody ever walked in my office saying I can't stop taking LSD. It never happened. <laughs> never. <laughs> Not even once. <laughs> so one of the things I do is Google alerts. And I have all of the drugs, all the classic, all the psychedelics on Google Alert. So I get updates every single day about what happens around the planet. And there are problems with psychedelics. And they're always exactly the same thing. It's behavioral, and it comes down to lack of supervision. It's the context is inappropriate. 100% of the time. So therefore, what we need to do is we need to regulate psychedelics in a way that manages for that. So let's talk about what that actually looks like. First of all, what we recommend is who should be doing it. We recommend the creation of a commission. Because governments which swing widely between polar opposite belief systems would not be able to do it in any kind of stable way. And so a commission could do it in a stable way if it was given a public health mandate and allowed a long time frame to do it over. We suggest that it not be government, but it also not be commercialized, and it be responsible for the regulation of all currently illegal drugs and perhaps even alcohol and tobacco. And then we recommend the creation of a new profession, and we call it psychedelic supervisors. It's a professional body that would function in a similar way to, to doctors and other professions. So they would have a responsibility to report to their college. So it would be a professional designation. And they would, the college would establish, monitor, and enforce standards. And within this profession, Individuals could have specialties in the same way that physicians can have specialties. One of the specialties could be post-traumatic stress disorder psychotherapy. They could be offering ayahuasca ceremonies, managing multi-day dance festivals, running psychedelic small group experiences for payment would be various specialties that they could have. 
and they would be certified. Actually, they'd be licensed. They'd be licensed. And so here is an example of what the license could look like. I want to have one of these on my wall. So what would the psychedelic supervisor be responsible for? Essentially, they would be responsible for set, which is expectation, setting, which is environment, and safety for eight hours after ingestion of the psychedelic. They'd be responsible for screening of participants, involving the participant in dosage decisions, certainly preventing driving under the influence, managing interactions between participants would be really important. You really don't want to hear somebody else's extroverted stress when you're in that place. And then you'd agree to work with other leaders to develop best practices. Now, I be this paper that we wrote was the paper that took me the most number of years, partly because I would present it at conferences and I would get challenged. And it took us a long time to figure out what to do with the absolute consistent challenge that we got, which was essentially this. Somebody would always put up their hand and say, I love psychedelics, and what I do with my wife in bed after we've taken psychedelics, I don't want supervised. <laughs> so, okay, so let's talk about that. So, we encourage a second stream, and the second stream is certification. So if somebody would like to self-supervise or supervise others, they can take a weekend or two, possibly three, training course that focuses on dosage, set, setting, and safety issues. And those with a certificate can then supervise themselves or work with friends around supervision of friends, but they can't offer professional services. They can't offer services for payment, and they can't treat medical conditions. Now, the tough one was youth access. How do we, how do we even think about youth access? And we kind of went all over the map on this. We went into Aboriginal communities and we thought about how they provide psychedelic experiences for youth. We looked at various parental approval around alcohol issues. We looked at youth access for health services. And we eventually came up with a model. And what we said is, yes, youth can access. By youth, we mean mature. Mature youth who are able to understand what they're asking for. Mature minors is the legal term, can ask for this experience and receive this experience, we would encourage them to involve their parents and have their parents participate, but they can receive the experience from trained adult professionals who have that as a specialty. In the psychedelic research, this is my favorite image, so I just wanted to show it to you. This was Petri et al.'s work using David Nutt's data of MRI analysis of the brain, the human brain function that is both normal and on the effect of psilocybin. The image on the right shows on the outside of it various parts of the brain. And what you see in normal conditions, various parts of the brain talk to themselves. The visual cortex talks to the visual cortex a lot, but it doesn't really talk to other parts of the brain very much. And the image on the, the right, <laughs> Did I get that right? The image that is more complex shows a huge change in the level of interactions between various brain parts. And I think that particular image shows really why we see a lot of the outcomes of the other research that is now becoming very popular. So I'm involved. Where am I at here? Okay. I'm involved with the study. So I'm doing the first, I'm involved with a group of people that are doing the first legal research in psychedelics in Canada in 40 years. Yay! So we're looking at the effectiveness of MDMA, methylene dioxymethamphetamine, um, in the context of post traumatic stress disorder. We finished our phase two clinical trial, and the last time you took a drug, it had gone through three stages. In order for a drug to be prescribed, in Canada and the United States, it has to have gone through stage one, two, and three clinical trials. We have now completed our stage two, and we are gearing up for our phase three. So in phase two, it's a multi-country study as well. So we are one 
place that collects data that gets fed into a central, a central database. But in our site in Vancouver, we treated six people in phase two. We had two teams of therapists, and it took us three to four months. So in phase three, which we are planning, we plan on treating between 20 and 40 people. We'll have three or four teams of therapists, and we really hope to be hospital-based. We don't have a contract signed yet, but we have an agreement in principle to be working with one of the large local hospitals. Why do psychedelics work in the context of therapy? What is it that they offer as medicine for treatment of a variety of conditions? One of the things they offer is a reduction of permeability between the conscious and the unconscious mind. We have access to unconscious material we do not normally have access to. And if you think about post-traumatic stress disorder being an unconscious tape loop that is buried and then encrusted with fear, that tape loop becomes available to us in the context of psychedelic psychotherapy. They all, there is also a resolution that happens. Now, the, psycho, the psychotherapeutic process helps the resolution, but there is something also about the medicine itself that helps with resolution. The PTSD tape loop is encrusted with fear, and most traditional therapies that try to approach it result in a huge fear response. MDMA reduces fear. And so it's very helpful in this context. The portal effect, I talked about that, wow, I've done something huge. And there's something about spirituality. There's something about, I'm not just this little body doing this tiny thing. I'm part of this whole universe. And given that context, it's really helpful to treat the stresses and the agonies that we struggle over in all of our normal lives. There's also a process of connection. The alliance between the therapist and the subject is the greatest predictor of success of any therapeutic process. And psychedelics, specifically the pathogens, are really skillful at that. And detox and addiction treatment are, can be helped in the process of psychedelic psychotherapy. So this is what we want to do. This is our vision for the future. We are going to open up psychedelic psychotherapies or psychedelic psychotherapy clinics in Vancouver and other large urban centers. And we're also going to open them up in beautiful natural environments. One does not discover new lands without consenting to lose sight of the shore for a long time. The saddest aspect of life now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. I'm done. While you're, while you're getting settled, I'm going to go ahead and start us off with a question. Mark, I was wondering, uh, how on earth do you fund psychedelic drug trials? Like, how do, who gives you money for that? Well, who doesn't fund us? Large pharmaceutical companies. <laughs> because we're actually taking people off of substantial mental health medications. The people that are coming to our study have had long histories of mental health medications, and we're at the end of it, many of them aren't on medications anymore. So pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies don't really like what we're doing. And we give MDMA in our study three times. So it's a three dosage experience, that's it. There is no business model that will ever make any money at what we're doing. So how we actually fund it is um, we're about to, I'm actually I'm glad you asked. We're about to launch a, in April, we launch a crowdfunding campaign. We are going to get funded by the people. We're going to get funded by a huge number of people that see what we're doing and contribute very small amounts of money. Stay tuned. So we can give you money to yes. give other people drugs. Yes. <laughs> yes. Who has a good question? Or a challenge, to be honest. Please introduce yourself and go ahead. Well, 
Hi, I'm Victoria. Um, so I'm wondering how the average normie person can get involved in this type of activism and support without um, being perceived or possibly feeling like a degenerate. Right. So the research door is wide open. And we're doing it within the context of a large local hospital. And the person who I'm really hoping is going to lead the show for us is both a medical doctor and a PhD. That's some clues. And, um, and so, well, it's the look, right? So I, I think we're presenting ourselves as mainstream. So it's not taboo to show up anymore. So how people can, can help, I mean, we actually do have a volunteers meeting, and there's all kinds of things you can do. But if you have wide networks of anybody, and you would participate in our crowdfunding campaign to let people know what we're doing, that would be great as well. But certainly, there's lots of things that people can do. Yes? You still might be a degenerate, Victoria. <laughs> I know your mother. I know your mother. Hi there. My name is Maffer, and uh, my question will be, why do you think humans need drugs to do human things that we're able to access through other activities? And why? I think the main thing is why. Interesting question. Um, what I observe is that drug using behavior is one of the oldest human behaviors. It's funny when you talk about drugs long enough with an audience, sooner or later you start talking about sex. So here we go. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that sexual behavior has been around since before recorded history. I think, I think, I think I'm on safe ground. Drug using behavior has been around that long. And it's not just the human species. There's a book out there called Intoxication, the Universal Drive for Mind-Altering Substances by a fellow named Siegel, who looked at other species that use drugs. It's an incredibly common human behavior. And the why question is everything from spirituality to suppression of pain to connections with others to reducing physical and emotional pain to helping sleep to helping be awake. There's a huge range of human experiences that people take drugs for. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? It just is. Thank you, Mark. Very interesting uh, presentation. I'm Iriana, by the way. Um, so my question is, um, in regard to spirituality, do you think that you can become spiritual just because you took a pill or um, a drug? Um, and my question, I think, builds on um, use of um, these drugs in uh, native communities where they have set of beliefs um, and stories behind that get uh, reinforced by taking drugs. So do you think it's possible to have let's say, um, random Vancouverite who has never been spiritual before, take a drug and all of a sudden uh, become a completely different person? So, thank you for the question. The research has tried to explore that question. So we observe Aboriginal history often is about spirituality, but the science has has some catching up to do. So the first research looking at the spirituality of psychedelic drugs was actually the Tim Leary crowd. It gave a group of seminary students psilocybin in a high dosage in a Good Friday um, sermon and a placebo to half of the seminary students. And they recorded a profound exper spiritual experience with half of them that were given the psilocybin and the other ones just went to a boring presentation. <laughs> now, admittedly, that particular study just to be clear, if we're going to talk about psychedelics and we're going to do an objective analysis of the research, there were some real problems with that original study. Specifically, there was an individual who escaped. He went out on the street and he was wanted to share his newfound revelations with strangers up and down the street. It didn't go well. <laughs> so they, they, they didn't provide a container that worked appropriately. So there was a real problem with that and people don't tend to talk about that. So we need to talk about everything when we're in the new discussion around psychedelics. But the, and, as a fellow named Griffiths, who is now trying to document spirituality again, and he's doing it differently, but specifically, he's, at, he's giving people a high dose of psilocybin and saying, was this the most meaningful experience of your life, and was this the most spiritual experience of your life? And what he found is, yes, for many of them, a high percentage. And then he went back 14 months later and asked the same question. And what is absolutely fascinating about that piece of research is 14 months later, the effect went up. 
Now, I can't think of any intervention you do that is a health intervention, and you go back and ask the individual 14 months later about how is that impacting your life now, and you'll have an increased response. I, I can't think of anything. So the research, the science of spirituality is starting to happen, and it's actually kind of interesting. Hi, my name is Ray. Um, in your model with the, with the U-curve where there's uh, market regulation of drugs, I'm, wor I'm wondering uh, who's going to be making the actual drugs? Essentially, pharmaceutical companies um, is the question, is, is the answer. So really, the, the, the question I think is more interested is how would it be regulated? How would, would they be able to market and advertise them? And in a public health approach, no, they wouldn't. It would only be available through the college. And so it wouldn't be a branded product. If you want to look at the difference between commercialization and a public health approach, the sort of the key issue for me is, it a, is it a branded product? Is it a funky logoed pill with a smiling face on it that says, take me now? And the answer should be no. This should look like a medicine, and it should be used as a medicine. Hi, Mark. I, I just wanted to ask about um, the, the politics uh, of all this aside from like the science. I know you're trying to do this uh, study and, and many others, and you alluded to in, uh, I guess, like the 70s when people, uh, there was a stigma associated with acid. So I'm wondering for you, what's your sense of like the labyrinth of government and like public opinion in the face of you getting like really definitive concrete scientific studies that say it's a good thing. Do you like, can you comment on the extent to which politics will be an obstacle from your view? Well, we were approved to do our study under the Harper government. Whoa. <laughs> what, did you slip an MDMA? All right. <laughs> so essentially what, what happened, what happened is there was some individual, and I don't know who that person is, that observed in the United States, in the FDA, that there are two paths to do drug discovery. One path is the psychedelic path, which is basically it's banned and you can't do it. And, or it's, it's not actually banned. It's, it's made so incredibly difficult you can't do it. It's legal, but you can't do it because we won't let you because of the bureaucratic hurdles that we'll make you go through. And the other is traditional drug discovery, which is the last time you took a prescription drug. That had to go through the traditional phase one, two, and three clinical trials. And the person observed that to do to do an, a traditional drug discovery is enormously difficult, very costly, and does produce two things. It says this is safe and it's effective. It doesn't hurt the human being and it has this effect, is really what the process is. And they said, why don't we just have one process? Why don't we let psychedelic drugs go through the normal drug discovery process to see if any of them make it through? And essentially that opened the door to the research. And that changed it in the United States, and it's changed it in Canada. And because the local federal government um, tends to mirror what's happened in the States, they've basically given us approvals all the way along. Two quick last questions. I'm going to go over there. Hey, Mark. Uh, Nevin here. I'm just wondering how important is it uh, for the set and setting when you're dealing with uh, psychedelics? Like if you go into with a negative mood, will you almost be guaranteed a bad trip or will that kind of bring you out? Well, the set and setting are crucial. The expectation and the environment are profound determinants of the outcome. But going in with um, concerns is normal for our research. So we treat people that have chronic persistent severe post-traumatic stress disorder, and they come with the expectation that they will deal with that. So it isn't about, you know, dancing with colored lights and hugging people. You know, it's a really, <laughs> really difficult process that people engage with where they look at something that is not working for them in their brain. So yes, it is challenging, and there's a huge amount of distress that's expressed, but it's given a context and a container that makes it absolutely completely okay. In fact, it makes it a healing experience. Who really wants this? Like really feels strongly. I want to give it to a woman. Is there? 
So if in a fight, which of you would win? <laughs> scale, of, scale of one to 10, how good is your question? Go, go, pick a number. That's not, 10, you say 10? Seven? Seven's not very good. Eight and a half? <laughs> this is good. <laughs> you better word this really well. I know. <laughs> um, what are the issues that you see with institutionalizing this? What are the dangers that come about it? Um, what are your alternatives? And do you see this as some sort of parallel to colonizing what's kind of a free thing? Thank you. <laughs> okay. So you want me to explore the dark side. Okay, so there are some dark sides. So dark side number one is commercialization. You know, if this is seen as a commercial venture and psychedelics become commercialized and sold and packaged and it becomes an agenda that's about corporate profit, we have a problem on our hands. But just because we're having this close intimate space, I'll tell you another one that personally gets me. What I'm aware of is that, having worked in the addiction services for many years, is that most people who are attracted to the field are fabulous, compassionate, kind, wonderful people who really want to help other people. But occasionally, because you're working with incredibly vulnerable people, you attract predators. Psychedelics produce a level of vulnerability in people that is absolutely profound. And so we really need to be thoughtful about who provides the service, that they come from exactly the right place, which is heartfelt compassion. And not everybody that shows up wanting to do the work will have that experience. Okay. With that, we're going to... Thank you. Thank you, Mark.